Hello everybody, thanks for joining us. Um, this session is called Expanding Edible Horticulture in Wales, what it takes and why we should do it. And we're going to focus on building an ambition for the future of edible horticulture, what it would mean for more fruit and vegetables to be produced in Wales and how can we make it happen. Um, just been asked to do a couple of housekeeping points before we get stuck in. Um, so firstly, um, the organisers have asked you not to take and share screenshots during the session. It is being recorded, so if you don't want to appear on um, any screen, then please just turn off your video using the option at the bottom. Um, I'll be chairing the session. My name's Hannah Pitt. I'm from the Sustainable Places Research Institute at Cardiff University, where I currently research issues around skills and horticulture, looking from Wales outwards, um, trying to understand how knowledge around horticulture um, systems could be made more resilient. So I'm just going to give you a bit of an idea of the thinking behind the session before I introduce the first of our three speakers. Um, so I think it's apparent for multiple reasons, not least climate crisis and health needs, that it seems to make sense for people to eat more fruit and vegetables. And I think the importance of having more domestically produced um, fresh produce has been particularly apparent during the COVID pandemic, as many people turned to local farms and box schemes to get access to fruit and veg. Some of you will have been involved in the discussions Amber, Sarah and I and Food Sense Wales um, facilitated around the time, the early days of the pandemic. Um, and one of the things that really came through from those discussions was that growers really have an appetite to produce more in Wales. So this session kind of builds on those conversations and is um, part of an ongoing um, exploration of, of this. And what we're really trying to do is build consensus on what needs to happen. Um, we think there's lots of interest in making progress in uh, producing more in Wales, and we're really hoping today to focus on action rather than problems. So we, how we're going to have the format today is we'll have three speakers, each speaking for about 10 minutes, and I'll introduce each of, each of them before they make their contribution. We'll then take some time to use Slido to um, get some canvas some views from those who are joining us. Um, so if you want to get that ready, I will put the... Um, details in the chat so you open a new window and go to slido.com or you can do it on your phone and then you'll need that event number there which is 49987 so you can already get that ready if you'd like um, and we'll be looking at those after the three speakers and then we will have lots of time for questions from all from you all and um, if you have a question at any point please do put it in the chat box it would be really helpful if you can put a queue before it just because the chat tends to get quite busy. So it will really help to um, pick out that which are the questions. And if it's to uh, go to someone in particular, if you want to put their name next to it, which of the speakers you're directing it to, that will also be great. Um, and then I will read the uh, questions from the chat just so we can get have a chance to um, get through as many as we can in the time at the end. So that's all the background and the um, logistics um, sorted. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is Pete Seger. Peter, sorry, Peter Seger is um, of Blind Camel Farm, and he describes himself as a grower of many years standing based near Aberiron on Cardigan Bay. He's committed to producing the highest quality produce possible with the lowest carbon footprint achievable. His is a small family farm producing veg, salads and flowers all year round, supplying farmers markets, restaurants and shops. And it's been an organic farm since 1974. And some of you may have seen recently that um, an article written by um, Peter on his vision for horticulture in Wales was published, uh, which was why we were so delighted he was um, willing to contribute to the session today. So with that, I will hand over to Peter. Just need to, yeah, there we go. Need to unmute Peter. Okay, as we are sitting here now, there are a lot of people in Wales who are working on a new agricultural policy for the country. And there's some very exciting things happening within that that part of the agricultural strategy will include, of course, horticulture. And there, the door is open. We have no clarity as to what the policy really will be. So it's up to all of us to make a contribution to influence the direction of that policy. And 
It, one of the wonderful things about being a grower is you get plenty of time on your own to think about things. And I have been thinking for ages about a simple way that we could really address the issues uh, that are facing us, the, issue, the issues of emissions, of environmental vitality, of health, jobs, and a secure and resilient food supply. And that is, we've got to first stop importing as much fresh fruit and vegetables, indigenous fresh fruit and vegetables, as we are at the moment. So I've made a stab at a discussion point, which is that Wales, by the year 2035, will produce 75% of its indigenous fruits and vegetables. So it's Wales 75 by 35. That's the campaign. And I would like it to be a campaign. And I would like government to be involved, county councils to be involved, organizations like Tavi Cymru, NFU, FUW, God help us, supermarkets possibly, and all sorts of other people. As many as possible, because each party has a particular and distinct role to play. And if you then say, well, what are the roles that we want to play. Well, there are, in any sort of strategy to do with food, there are two aspects, primarily two aspects. There's production and then there's the demand. So I'll address those separately. In order to really uh, up the production level to meet this target, I think we need, as somebody was saying in the session this morning, a large number of substantial farms producing the field crops that we need, and probably a hundred of them over and above what we have at the moment is, are required. We probably need about another 200 small to medium sized uh, farms, farms like mine, like Blind Camel, which produce a range of crops throughout the year uh, using protected cropping as well as field crops. And then we need a huge expansion of the small specialist units producing flowers, producing uh, herbs, and fruit and vegetables for local sales and much else beside. But that's a really important sector. And then we need a massive expansion of allotments, city farms, rooftop growing, public parts converting to growing fruits and vegetables, and so on and so forth. I mean, a massive expansion. And when people say at the moment, well, there's only maybe about 3% of our national demand supplied by um, farms in Wales, and we've got to go to 75%, that's maybe a bit too challenging. And I say, no, I mean, if we look back in my early days as a, involved in the organic movement, we have moved from a tiny fraction, almost nothing, to a global movement that has captured the spirit and imagination of populations all around the world. And we can do that here as well. So I see no problem whatsoever in achieving those targets. But it will need a, an infrastructure, a support structure to make it work. Uh, I think it will need probably two dedicated horticultural colleges. It will need the county councils to take ownership of this idea in part. To in encourage farmers markets that they're not an optional extra but they're an, an intrinsic part of the spirit of the community of every area and to do that they should make sure that the stalls at least for a considerable period of introduction to new young small producers are free and they don't have to pay lots of money as we do every week at the moment we can afford it to do it because we've been going long enough uh, to pay these fees, but for small producers, it's tough. We need to develop the public procurement thing that was covered a little bit in the session before lunch. But the schools, the education, educating children on a more harmonized way of looking at the world, a more environmental way, a more connected way of looking at the world is incredibly, incredibly important if they're going to be the customers of the future. And we need finance. We need finance, imaginative new strains of finance to be able to encourage young and new growers 
to get loans, to be able to buy the equipment, to get the irrigation and the protected structures and all the other things that allow this expansion to happen at a reasonable, measured, but not slow pace. We don't want to wait for 10 or 15 years till somebody's accumulated a little bit of money to be able to buy something they ought to have had to be efficient right in the beginning. And on that land, that has to be another area we've got to make land accessible, accessible to uh, young, young farmers. There should be tax incentives to existing farmers to rent out or to let um, large pockets of their, their, their land to young people in a way that is interesting for them and for everyone else. And to ensure that the county councils do not sell off any more of their existing farms, if they have any left at all, that is. But more than that, and most of all, it's, this is a, a political campaign. It's a campaign that's for all the people in Wales, by the people in Wales, in order to really make a contribution to the global problems that we face. And Wales can do this, will do this, and I hope all of us can help to do this. Thank you. Thanks very much, Peter. And how great to start off with such a clear ambition. The uh, Wales 75 by 35 is hopefully something we can all, I can see applause already. <laughs> it sounds like we're going to have some great support for this, uh, this um, idea of a campaign. So we'll move on to um, our next speaker. And as um, just a reminder that if you have questions you want to put to Peter or anyone else, just type them in the chat box and we'll go through them um, in the second half of the session. So now I'm going to introduce Amber Wheeler. Um, so Amber set up and ran Narbeth Allotments and Community Orchard in Pembrokeshire. And she's been involved in horticultural research in Wales since she wrote, Could the St David's Peninsula Feed Itself? Uh, her PhD then looked at Wales fruit and vegetable requirement, and she now works at the Food Foundation on the Peas Please um, initiative, which is UK wide, focused on increasing vegetable consumption. This year, she undertook a baseline study on edible horticulture in Wales for Tuvi Cymru, and she's currently wor working also with Food Sense Wales and Social Farms and Gardens on a pilot small grant capital investment scheme. So over to Amber. Thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen. Thanks very much, um, Hannah. I'm so delighted to be following on from Peter, who has been growing vegetables in Wales for longer than I've been alive. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, beat that. Um, so, yes, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about where we are in terms of fruit and veg production in Wales. That's sort of so um, where we are in order to know where, where we want to go to. And I wanted to expand on what Peter was saying in terms of this 75 percent and what it might look like. My numbers are a bit higher than yours, um, Peter, for how many producers um, it might take, and I'll go into that a little bit more. But I've looked at your vision, and I think it's a really great one. Um, and um, yeah, I'll talk about a little bit more about that. And then I'll go over some of the things that have been done to increase consumption um, that I know of. And then um, it will, I'll, Sarah will follow on from me. Um, so, um, what's Wales producing now? This data was collected for Tuvi Cymru as part of a baseline study um, on fruit and veg production in Wales. Um, we found that there were around 204 fruit and vegetable producers, so not very many, it's quite a small sector. Um, of these, around 145 are vegetable producers, 120 of those small scale and about 25 larger scale. Um, the rest are made up of vineyards, um, blackcurrant uh, producers for like uh, Ribena and that sort of thing, and then apple and pear producers, which goes into sort of cider and perry production. So that's where we're at. That amount of um, vegetable uh, production um, fruit and veg production is about enough to give the population around a quarter of a portion per person per day in Wales. So that's where we are. 
Now, I wanted to expand a bit on this vision. If we were to grow 75% of the vegetables eaten in Wales, um, then it, to, at the moment, Wales is eating around 1.9 portions of um, vegetables per day. We're eating a very small amount compared to um, what we recommend um, for health. As, as you know, it's um, the Eat Well Guide recommends uh, 3.5 portions of veg, seven of both fruit and veg. So if we were going to produce this 75%, that would be 1.4 portions per person per day, which would be about 130,000 tonnes um, per year. Now, at the moment, I estimate that we're producing around a 10% of that, about 13,400. So what we'd be looking at just in terms of that vision that Peter set out is increasing production about 10 times. So roughly speaking, we're talking from going from hundreds of uh, producers in Wales to thousands of producers in Wales. So from about 145 veg producers to 1,450 veg producers. Um, of course, this, is, this ambition um, is just for vegetables, but I wonder whether we should be including fruit in that, in terms of um, the potential to have more orchards and um, that sort of thing. So that's if we just match fruit and veg uh, our veg production with consumption, but we may want to put a sort of bolder ambition in there about trying to increase more towards um, five or seven a day. But again, that'll be more than 10 times, but I think 10 times the amount of um, horticultural production in Wales would be a really, really great start. I mean, if we can get there by 2035, then that would be amazing. So, the five key barriers I talked about last um, farming conference a, a, a year ago when we were all in Aberystwyth were these um, these these five key barriers um, of training and retaining talent, vision, greater collaboration, making prices work for producers and consumers and increasing production at the same time as consumption. And I think there's been massive progress on addressing these barriers in terms of training and retaining talent. Um, Sarah's going to talk as we um, about all they're doing with Tuffy Cymru. Um, you have to remember that we have um, in, in Wales investment in a horticultural um, uh, umbrella body to support the commercial horticulture industry, which is sort of an enviable position because the other nations don't have this. We're in a pretty good situation um, and long may it last that that investment goes on. But I think we need some more investment too. So then we have the sort of need for a vision, which is what we're talking about today and the greater collaboration. And I was really pleased to see that Tuvi Cymru in their action plan have, um, are going to convene a group of stakeholders to come together to create that vision. And we'd like to talk to you a bit more about that um, later on. Um, then the making prices work for producers and consumers. I think this is really, really tricky. Um, there's a lot needed on supply chain fairness um, and, um, and developing more box schemes, et cetera. And then increasing production at the same time as consumption. Again, more, more needing to be done. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we have been doing to try and increase consumption. So there's been a fantastic amount of activity um, by local producers engaging with their customers and expanding the amount of veg boxes being sold in Wales. And we know that's a pattern that's gone across um, the board in England and Scotland and Northern Ireland too. Um, in terms of peas, please, um, we've had our pledges who've been increasing the amount of availability of vegetables. 163 million more portions have been sold by Peace Please Pledges over the last two years. But it's been a very challenging year, as we all know, with COVID. Um, and our stats at the moment are showing that supermarkets have not increased the amount of vegetables that have been sold overall from last year. So even though there's a lot of talk about um, people cooking more from scratch etc that's not showing up in supermarket sales but perhaps it will come through in the veg box the veg box area and more people growing their own i really hope so when we see the sort of um, national diet and nutrition survey results coming out a bit later on we've also got um the power that's been working um 
on that um, inspiring kids to eat more veg piece. I mean, uh, Peter talked about education and those uh, veg power has been going into schools and working with schools on that. And there's been some good progress there. Um, there's a lot of work on policy going on to increase production and consumption at the same time and the development of producer or um, the new producer organization scheme which supports horticulture producers to join together to um, to to um, sell more veg but also there's a chance there that those sorts of producer organizations um, according to DEF where they're sort of starting to talk about it might be linked to getting support if they're trying also trying to increase consumption. I think that's quite a good move. That's a, that's a way of investment going into horticulture. And then there's um, a lot of work being done on um, local procurement pilots. And I know you were talking about it earlier. And I think um, Sarah is going to talk a little bit more about it next. And that's it from me. Thank you, Amber. Really good to hear that there is lots going on and already um, progress since you um, shared some of the um, data last year. Um, and also good to see people engaging in the chat already, um, raising some of the issues they'd like to, um, to look at uh, in the discussion. Um, so we'll move straight on to Sarah then. So Sarah Gould is uh, currently working with Lantra, where she's been working since 2005. And she's worked there on projects across the food drink supply chain, but is currently project manager for Tuvy Cymru Growing Wales. And this project aims to support and facilitate commercial horticultural businesses to be more productive, prof profitable, and able to work with change. She's previously studied at the Royal Agriculture University in Sirencester. She also worked in industry for a time and uh, also taught in further education at various colleges. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Sarah. You're on mute, Sarah. Schoolgirl error, sorry about that. There we go. Thank you, Hannah, Amber, and Peter. So, what would it mean for more fruit and vegetable to vegetables to be produced in Wales? Just checking everybody can see the screen share. Yes, um, and really I'm just going to go through how we fit into the jigsaw, what we've been up to, what we've been doing, look a little bit about where we're going for the winter period and what we see as some of the opportunities and challenges. So, It's a, it, Tubby Cymru is a busy, exciting project aimed at simulating growth in Wales's commercial horticultural sector. We support commercial growers and horticultural businesses capitalise on their new market opportunities. It's all around training and development, but that training is very, very flexible in terms of the support and advice that um, we can offer and we're not we're not really based around teaching basic horticulture the growers are great at that they've got fantastic skills already and the skill set we know that you've got to be a grower it's similar to a farmer it's a very vast skill set so for us it's more the icing on the cake that high-end cpd training that might just make a shift change difference to the business we include edibles, ornamentals, um, organic, every, every type of horticultural business we cover. I know primarily we're concentrating on edibles today and we're funded through the Welsh Government Corporation Supply Chain. Back in 2016, we went and surveyed growers to find out what their opportunities and challenges were. And from that, we put forward a delivery plan for further funding. Um, so it is very much a demand led project. We get good feedback from growers and we're continuing developing training that they're asking us for. We've, we've got the beauty of our funding pot is we are allowed to have flex in our delivery. So um, we work. We work through um, networks primarily. We've got our vegetable network. And pre-COVID, we worked on um, going out to grower sites with workshops, doing study visits. Our veg network had a fantastic visit to Blind Camel last year with Peter, led by Debbie. 
and um, they came back from there inspired, especially about Peter's composting system and perhaps ways that they could change their growing methods. So our, our networks are very active. We've had to change the way we work during COVID, but they come online and have group meetings where we put in specialist speakers and they have topics to discuss and they work collaboratively and there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning goes it going on in those groups so we you know it's hard not getting out on site but we have seen tremendous advantages and we've probably been able to incorporate more growers in those sessions from um you know from geographical areas that might not be able to get to a training site We've this week launched our commercial horticulture action plan. Uh, we see that this is a, a roadmap for Welsh Government and the industry, and it's taking a multi-stakeholder approach. I think I'm really excited about what's happening. You can feel the momentum building. There's, like Amber said, a tremendous amount more collaboration. We're, we're all working for the same goals, the same ends. So we, we work with Welsh Government three divisions for us or three departments in Welsh Government, Plant Health, Agriculture, Food Division, and we're in regular conversations with them. Uh, but this is this plan is about scale up achievements, but green growth. It's a way of um, Welsh Government delivering on their strategic goals, whether that's in terms of the circular economy. We know already horticulture has been mentioned in the Green Task Force recovery um, plan. So just briefly, our achievements to date, we're in year three of a five year project. We've trained nearly a thousand people and we've engaged um, with 179 grower businesses. We're working on that all the time to increase our engagement. Our database is 500 growers, but that's, uh, that's businesses who've had a significant engagement with us. Um, we, get, we do have, um, feedback from growers all the time. We're in contact with them. So we know what those challenges are that they're facing on a weekly basis. So whilst I'm extremely excited, I think I'm quite realistic as well, because you hear of the challenges in terms of, of the weather or the, um, you know, by purchasing new machinery and equipment, staffing, labor, um, or land acquisition, like I can see somebody's put in the chat. Um, so these are all things we're aware of and working on. So during the COVID period, we've delivered 16 webinars to 400 participants. We've run what we call power hour sessions for our networks, where we put in that technical expertise and we're seeing a tremendous amount of peer support. So our pumpkin group that is um, primarily pick your own pumpkins, they had a very challenging period building up to Halloween. Uh, they, they came on as group session and really supported each other. You get some of the newer growers throwing in ideas around social media and digital marketing, and then the more experienced growers with their advice on um, and their experience on growing. And then they had to shut down on the 26th of October. Um, we managed for any of those growers that had a surplus, we worked with farmers in England um, who were still looking for suppliers of pumpkins to come over and negotiate prices on that. And that seemed to work quite well. Um, Pre-March, we used to go out and do study tours face to face. I've kind of forgotten what that feels like at the moment. But now we've changed that to offer virtual study visits. We had an excellent one as part of the Plant Health Conference with Springfields in Pembrokeshire. Uh, Nick and Pat have been growing fruit and veg for years. They're very experienced growers. And on that virtual tour, they were talking about their changes over the years in terms of pesticides and now using bioprotectants and how they go about that. So that, that's on the website if anybody wants to investigate. We've put over 75 resources onto the Knowledge Hub. Um, that's expanding, worth a look. And we've got what we call a rapid response. We do a lot of what we class as training is that one-to-one -one delivery. And actually Zoom really facilitates that. So we can do a lot of that one-to-one -one delivery, whether that's with an agronomist or whether that's a digital marketing specialist, financial management, somebody who you want to buy some GDPR and, and your privacy policy. That's what we've had 
um, in the last couple of weeks. So it is quite diverse in terms of the support we offer. And more recently, we've delivered a plant health conference. So Stephen, I share your pain. Um, and much as it's been a fantastic um, conference, and I'm sure everybody has really enjoyed, there's a lot of work gone behind the scenes. So well done. This is some of the um, feedback we've had from our growers. Just we've just taken out um, a couple of, of statements. And you'll see from this, there's quite a range of different growers in there. And I think, um, oh, that's one from Kate, who I think might be on the call. So thank you, Kate. Um, and then I just wanted to go through a couple of other things that I thought might be of general interest to this group. So our plans for the winter, we're putting in place a programme of training support for farm assurance for growers. So those growers who are looking at salsa, red tractor, leaf mark. And I think this is the sort of building blocks that we're trying to put in place. So whilst the discussions are going on around procurement, this is the sort of thing that growers will need to go through in order to access those different markets or contracts um, or what is on offer. So we've, we've worked with a grower um, who's gone through Red Tractor and there's lessons learned there. And that training through the winter will be workshops and one-to-one -one advice um, to take growers through that process. Uh, we run and support a high-end CPD program with puffin growers. And as some of the only growers supplying supermarkets, we recognise the essential role that they'll play in upping and increasing the production of fruit and veg in Wales. Plant health, I've mentioned. We, we work quite closely with the CEA industry group and see that if we are, if, if this increase in production is going to happen, then we need to value and seek out all the alternative potential methods of increasing production. We work with social farms and gardens very closely on CSAs and are partnering a project with them. Um, again, recognising the role for scale up and, and replication there and, and identifying the models that are working extremely well. And we're working on a programme of support with NFU and thank you to John for his shout out for Tubby coming at the beginning of the conference. Um, those farmers who want to diversify or move back into horticulture or those farmers who grew years ago and just want to want to get back into growing, then we're looking at a program of support for them. Um, so it's busy, it's very, very exciting. I've got a fantastic team of experienced, passionate people, and we work with a tremendous amount of um, subcontractors. We are developing and quality assuring that bank of subcontractors, consultants, advisors, and that's the only way that we can achieve all this by the, um, the work that they do all in the background. So that's about it from us, but happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, there was somebody uh, asked what you were referring to by CPD and uh, helpfully we've had a, a definition of continuing professional development for anyone who wasn't sure what that was referred to. And great to hear from both Sarah and Amber, all the kind of parts of the jigsaw that are already in place of things that are going on. Um, and I'm make, keeping trying to keep track of all the questions so I can um, introduce them in a moment. I think the only other thing I would say on CPD, Hannah, is it's it's coming through so much more with the farming community as well. That they are professionals, they are tremendously experienced and skilled, and not necessarily recognised. So what we're trying to to in you know to make this term CPD more. Um, you know, more well used and more and so that those guys are recognised for the skills and qualifications that they already have. And the fact that they do continue that training through their life, lifetime. Great. Yeah, that's one of the things I always say when I'm talking about my research is that um, a lot of people talk about horticulture as being an unskilled area of work, which is, in my mind, completely ridiculous. You couldn't think of many more skilled jobs as far as I can see. Um, so we're going to give you all a chance to have a say now. So hopefully um, you will be able to 
go to the Slido um, questions we've set up. So what you need to do is go to in a, um, a window on your um, desktop browser or on your phone. Um, you need to go to slido.com and then you'll be asked to enter an event code and that's the number there for you. So it's 49987 and you will have a chance to answer three questions and I can, I think it looks like some of you already answered the first one. Um, so the first one asks about this target for increasing production of fruit and veg. Um, if you think it should be a 75% target as suggested by Peter and Amber, um, or maybe a bit lower to be slightly less uh, ambitious, or if you're not maybe sure about what the amount should be, but you're keen that there is a target, or if you think targets maybe aren't that helpful. Um, I'll just give it a moment and then I'll share the results. Uh, and I will just uh, go on to show you the next question for those who have already answered that one. So this question, if Welsh Government was to invest in, um, sorry, what? The second one is, if Welsh Government was to invest in supporting the expansion of horticulture, what should the money go on? So that is your chance to say what some um, Welsh Government money should be spent on if it was to help um, horticulture. And then third, the third question, which organisations and groups should be involved in a stakeholder group for Welsh horticulture? So as referred to earlier, um, one of the th actions that's in the new Tuvi Cymru action plan is to convene a, a stakeholder group um, who will take responsibility for developing a vision for Welsh horticulture. Um, so we'd be, it'd be useful to know or hear who people think should be included in that stakeholder um, group. So hopefully, let me going back and we can see what kind of answers are coming in. So it looks like we've got quite clear support for um, a 75% ambition. Um, and overall, nobody said that there shouldn't be a target. So it looks like we might be uh, needing to encourage Welsh Government to commit to a target to drive up production of fruit and veg in Wales. And on to the Second one, I think maybe I need to just change the settings on this. Uh, so hopefully we've got some answers coming in. What do people want the money to be spent on training, land, capital grants coming through and expressed in different ways, but seems to be quite a common one. Uh, capital grant getting bigger. <laughs> There's lots of people suggesting capital grants. Um, what are some of the, yeah, so lo lots of themes there, training, uh, startup grants, sporting incubators, actually spending on infrastructure, subsidy, startup finance. It's great to see lots of ideas, but also kind of quite, um, I think, quite achievable. A lot of those feel like they would be things that could uh, could be taken up by Welsh Government. I will leave this open. So if you you can keep contributing ideas as we go through the next part of the session. Uh, and then on to the third one. These are the organisations people want to see included. So we've got NFU, MacMythlon, Land Workers Alliance, NFFN, that's the one I'm not familiar with. I don't know if anybody knows what NFFN stands for. Maybe you can type it in the chat. Garden Organic, CSA Network. It's Nature Friendly Farming Network. Thank you. <laughs> Great, and again, I will leave this open so um, we people can keep contributing as we go through the discussion. Um, and we can have a look back at the end of the session as well, see if there's um, a clear kind of, sen uh, kind of consensus emerging. Um, but I think the thing that I, I take away from that is that people really like this idea of a target and also being quite ambitious, um, aiming for the 75%. The 
So as I said at the beginning, we have got left deliberately left plenty of time to go through questions. Um, and the first thing I was going to um, just put Peter on the spot since he opened up his presentation saying that um, he feels there's the, uh, the it's wide open for us to say what we want Welsh Government to do in terms of policy supporting horticulture. So I thought I'd just start by asking if you had any um, aspirations, Peter, for what you'd like them to be doing in terms of um, policy to support horticulture and this kind of expansion. Yes, no, no, I, I would like them to take the views of this sort of meeting and say, yes, we want to support you in ways that we practically and politically can, and, um, and not to rush into it. I mean, it takes time to work out how much, uh, what sort of funding is required, what sort of structure is required, and it's got to be an industry-led enterprise, so it's, we have to... We have to do the work collectively uh, as well, not for them to do the work, but I would like them to just make as part of their commitment that this idea, this target, 75 by 35, is something they own, believe in and want to support. That it becomes in the consciousness of everybody in Wales, that every consumer is supporting a healthy, vital, resilient, and way, uh, way for Wales to develop in the future and that the government is supporting that in every way they possibly can. And when I say it's, they're open now, there is a discussion paper out at the moment, or going out at the moment, I think it's a bit delayed because of COVID, um, to encourage people to put their ideas forward on this. And they're open. They, the views of the Welsh Government at the moment in the planning stage of the Agricultural Bill are more interesting and exciting than anything else I've ever heard anywhere in Britain or anywhere else around the world for that matter at the moment. And it, it is an exciting, potentially a very exciting time. And we can take a, a role, a leading role in doing this, all of us. Great. Thanks. Uh, yeah, agree. The sense of optimism um, seems to be um, quite strong, but also I think, yeah, this willingness to, to get on and do it and come forward with suggestions um, also seems to be apparent at the moment. Um, just seeing as it was something that came up in the discussion in the previous session, I was just going to ask um, Sarah to say a little bit about um, the public procurement um, side of things, because I know you, this is something that's come up um, and that you've been kind of discussing with growers. So I just wondered if you could share a little bit on insights you have to um, the potential around that, but also maybe what needs to change to make a procurement a potential driver to increase production. Yeah, I think I think it's a particularly challenging area myself. Um, and we've worked with a council up north who, and I suppose two of the things it boils down to are um, supply or you know continuous supply of quality produce and price and price always comes up so we worked with um we worked with the council in the north um they'd already secured a four-year contract with a wholesaler from north of england but they wanted to increase the amount of availability of welsh produce so we put them in touch with growers, but those growers are in the enviable situation at the moment that they could get a higher price elsewhere. Um, so through their farm shops, through their own customers, through their markets, what, whatever it was, they didn't have um, a surplus supply that could then go to the wholesalers. Um, and that even though the price was slightly higher, it was pence. For, um, so hence, what we we're still working on it. We we and we've seen that you know there's there's great work going on in these in these local areas like Carmarthenshire and and if they make progress, then fantastic. But that's one of the reasons we then put in place the farm assurance scheme training, so that as growers up production. I mean, we're seeing with the pumpkin guys because they had such a high demand some of those guys next year are planning on doing wholesale fields as well. Um, 
So I, I think it's all about the building blocks put in place so that if others, if others are working on procurement from a different angle, then we can be working on the procurement from the ground up and making sure that when the opportunity arises, but until we increase that number of growers and the scale at which they're growing, um, it's going to be a challenging one. I don't know whether you need to want to add anything, Amber. Um, just that I would tend to tend to agree. I think we need to have some successful pilots and some people working on those sort of key issues of how you manage to supply all year round to some for some of those really challenging contracts. Um, I think I think this can do attitude that's being been mentioned in the chat. I think I think that helps <laughs> because if you don't think you can do it, then you're not going to do it. So I think yeah, I think the people who are out there pushing forward with the pilots, I think that's great. And I think we need to pay attention to them. And if they work, then build on those. Um, just before we move on from the topic of public procurement, then um, Peter, is there anything to add from your perspective as somebody who's producing um, at the moment? Any thoughts on what on the potential of the procurement as a market? Uh, no, not much. That's great. <laughs> Short and sweet. Thank you. Um, Amber, yeah. Well, there's one more point. Um, in We don't have it in Wales, but in England, they have a school fruit and vegetable scheme, um, which uh, in, on, it could be a really effective way of driving, um, of supporting local producers. But going back to Sarah's point about cost, at the moment, those schemes um, they're not paying enough to um, to get, pay, get UK produce. Basically, they're really that that is all in, in mainly imported produce. So, a, a good way of doing it could be to increase the amount of governments are uh, going, uh, prepared to pay in order to for those procurement contracts to be successful for UK producers. Great. Just some, um, to draw attention to the fact that the Carmarthenshire example will be um, in a session tomorrow morning. So those who are interested in this topic should make sure to join then. Um, so what, we had a question um, that someone um, put in the chat asking about the um, the agriculture bill that's going through Westminster or has been through Westminster. And I think that um, in makes links to a wider point of learning from what's happening in other parts of the UK. Um, so I'm, I'd ask you, Amber, just to say a little bit about what you could, because your work crosses beyond the border um, of Wales, just to say a little bit about um, what you can, what we can learn from what's happening elsewhere and any particular um, policies or other measures that we might be able to try and uh, adopt here. Yeah, sure. Um, I think, um, so well, I work on uh, fruit and veg policy um, for Peace Please across the nations. Um, I think Wales is um, leading the way in many ways um, with what they're doing in terms of, as I said before, investing in um, an umbrella body like Tavi Cymru. And um, I think Northern Ireland and certainly Scotland are, are looking to Wales and that model. Um, so they want to learn from us. Um, but there are some things happening which I think we could learn from. In terms of um, what's going on in England, um, there's the Fruit and Vegetable Alliance, and they are pushing forward with a new vision um, for horticulture, and which um, it's just a two page vision. It's quite simple, but what's happening is that there's five working groups being set up from that vision to really work on how to um, achieve that vision. And those working groups are looking at productivity, uh, environment and environmental enhancement. They're looking at um, new entrants and um, uh, and jobs they're looking at um, supply chain fairness and finally how to increase consumption so we've got groups of people who are coming together under the sort of producer um, um, yeah um, umbrella to work together on those five areas and, and then working with DEFRA to uh, try and um, get those changes through, uh, you know, with all the changes that are happening with the Ag Bill. So I think that's that's hugely positive. But in Wales, we have a different model and we're a lot closer to government. Um, so it's not necessarily um, the way forward. But um, I think we should I think we should work together across the UK because I think there's a better chance that we're going to achieve change. But 
I feel from all the work that's going on that there's a huge excitement all all across all across the UK. And I know that um, in Southern Ireland, not in obviously not in the UK, but they invested nine million euros in horticulture. They com a commitment to invest nine million euros this year because of the sort of food security and and a better sort of. Uh, the green growth and all those types of things so there's yeah there's a lot of positive positivity and the more we work together I think the better. Great thanks we've got a question um, from Sh uh, Siobhan Madison so she's mentioned Tim Lang, George Monbiot and others have written around the uh, risks of food shortages arising from um, Brexit um, and whether this might be a shock which jumpstarts Welsh Government to increasing support for horticulture and local production. Can I, so can any I, of can I Yeah, go Peter. To that. I mean, Tim Lang is right. I mean, and it's not anything new for anybody who's been following Brexit. Uh, there are all sorts of threat to our, uh, our supply chain. And that's why, one of the reasons rather, why I felt so strongly about what we really need to do. Because it's not only about Brexit per se, it's also about water and water equity and water availability. I mean, because a lot of the produce that comes into Britain through in the, most of the season, the, the winter season, is coming from water deficit countries who are not going to be able to continue to be so profligate in their use of it. It also relates to farming systems and soil management systems. And we know that perfectly well. And we know that if you change your farming system, you can actually be much more, you're much better at conserving water. So for a whole range of reasons, the security of our food supply chain is endangered, intrinsically endangered. And so we have to, for, if for no other reason, we have to, I developed this 75% idea. But if I can also say to the last point about the, the UK, the one of the reasons I'm excited about what's happening in Wales in, in agriculture in generality, but not so much in England, is that the approach of the government are different in terms of their relationship to the environment to land management. And in England, they are still, as I understand it, locked in to spot environmental management rather than systems approach. And until we get rid of that sort of idea that you can put a pond here or a strip of land here or a hedge here, and that's great. Until we get rid of that concept, which has been excellent for so long, then we are not moving forward at all. Because unless you do all these things, you don't solve, if you, unless you change the management of soil, you don't change the water question. It, unless you change the management of soil, you don't change the environmental question, which means your crop protection issues. Are, so all these things are bound up in a holistic system, which as we understand it, the Welsh government gets. And that is a fantastic change. And so I would just like to advise my colleagues um, who are dealing with anything on an, a policy level to watch that level. Otherwise we end up with the grants going to the same large rich farmers that always got it. And the grants go to people who are not going to develop environmental benefits for the country and the nation. Great, thanks for that really important point there Peter. Um, I was just going to um, go back to some of the questions that have come through the chat. So there's a, um, one for directly I think really for Sarah which is what happens after five years? Um, so Tavi Cymru's uh, a five-year programme. Any thoughts about the longer term? Good point. Uh, yeah we're guaranteed until March 2023 but what we're doing as part of the project is making sure there's a legacy. So um, I can assure you we will be looking for future funding to support this program but if by any chance we don't secure it then we've got a legacy of the project and that legacy will be there's a database of growers, there's a database of quality assured trainers, consultants and advisors for the horticultural industry in Wales and there's going to be a bank of resources available that could be continued through another Welsh Government resource. So yes, that's where we are. 
Great, thanks. And another one for you, I think, really. So uh, various people were um, interested in the issue of um, who currently has land, um, so maybe landowners and farmers who aren't growing um, fruit and veg at the moment. Um, any ways that they could be encouraged either to make land available to those who want to do so or perhaps even be encouraged to move into growing themselves. So any um, experiences around that particular issue? Yeah, there, there is um, there is through Farming Connect a venture programme that matches those farmers who have available land with um, growers or people seeking to grow. I think it's well publicised for the farming community, but perhaps not so much. So, so we are working with them to help promote that to growers. So that's one um, aspect. Um, and then in terms of our work with NFU, we'll be we'll be working. Um, I mean, what we're working on with them is the programme for um, if they want to diversify into growing, but we'll also be looking at contracting and leasing um, and planning issues around if they want to link with growers. So there'll be further support there. So the support is available. Um, sometimes the challenges are matching pieces of land up in the north with growers in, say, Pembrokeshire or whatever. You know, that that is a challenge. And, and finding suitable land with next to markets and the right access and the right um, services available is a challenge too. I know there's some work with um, Brecon Beacons National Park, Monmouthshire Council, um, they're, they're doing a piece looking specifically at that as well. Great, thanks. Um, so we're gradually filling in the parts of the picture of things that are already happening and maybe at some point will um, need to be expanded. Um, for those who haven't seen in the chat, Amber's just shared some very important information about small growers being able to access capital grants. Do you want to just add any detail about that, Amber? Yeah, so uh, Food Sense Wales, and I don't know if Katie's on the call still, but um, she wanted to come in, but otherwise I will go ahead. Food Sense Wales, as part of the work they do with Peas Please, are offering um, a small number of grants from 2,500 to 5,000 5, pounds for, for you to invest. Um, and there's, um, yeah, please, please apply. Um, it, we're hoping that um, we're going to sh show a model of that you know if you do invest in these sorts of um, projects that there are huge benefits so we're going to evaluate it and um, hopefully we'll um, yeah as well as helping the few people this time we'll um, there'll be an example for Welsh Government of what these sorts of capital investment schemes could do. Right. And social farms and gardeners are administering it sorry so go to their website which is why they're why I've posted their website there. Great, thank you. Um, so we had another question um, which was asking about um, how we would be defining or determining quality produce. And I guess this might link to the question of whether if you set a target um, for increasing production, you're um, increasing the chance of people producing through maybe um, less environmentally rigorous means or producing less quality produce. So going for the numbers rather than the quality. So any of our panel like to suggest and have it to share any thoughts on that, the idea of quality produce? I, I would just say, I think that there's opportunity for increasing scale in all different areas of production. So what, you know, whether that's into Aldi, because that might be a price point that suits some households or whether that's increasing the veg box schemes available or where we're looking at um, controlled environment agriculture. I, I think there's a place and yes, I agree, of course, the, the quality has got to be monitored, but I don't think we've got a mechanism of monitoring quality or that would be an area we would get into as, as such. I can see nods from others. Peter, did you want to add anything on the question of quality over quantity? No. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> So we've got a copy of the, the I would say the, the only other thing I would add very quickly is we, I had a, a presentation from work the Welsh Government is doing on brands and Welshness and um, it, it's slightly linked but seven out of ten Welsh shoppers see Welshness 
um, on the pack, making them more likely to buy it. But also a third of English shoppers are more likely to buy that produce if it's got a Welsh branding. And there's no, do we make the most of that Welsh quality mark of the Red Dragon? Because there's no restrictions apparently on using that. Yeah, Amber, go on. Well, just, I would just agree that we need to keep an eye on uh, nutrient quality of, um, of produce juice and the example um that we had at the fruit and veg alliance the other the other week was that um, in, in terms of the tomato industry they went for increasing the amount of tomatoes in, incredibly but um the taste really went downhill because of the production systems and so um you've got to keep an eye on nutrient content too and um usually kind of um production systems that are good for the environment tend to to be more nutrient dense i would say um, not very scientifically or referenced right now. Can I, may, may I interject? Um, and my apologies for not answering or answering so abruptly and negatively, but I was otherwise occupied because I'm just fascinated um, when I'm looking at the screen and 90% of the people in this conference are, are, are not of my gender. And I thought th this is the most fantastic thing you know. And so uh, but I, I'm totally involved and committed and interested in the whole question of quality and I think it's the at the base of everything we do and and it should be nothing other than that and so but the question is what is quality and this answer has been asked for a long 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 time and we're still with all the brilliant brains in the world still trying to struggle to answer it correctly and uh, we will carry on doing that and everybody will of course but it, it is part of the whole cycle, you know, quality comes from those factors that are involved in influencing the health of soil, primarily. I mean, varieties have an importance, but primarily it's about soil. And so if you do that, you will give your customers something special. And that's why in Wales, we can produce really good vegetables, even though we don't have lots of grade one land. We have enough good land, and if we have good systems, good management practices, we can produce a better quality than the English any day, and the Spanish, and the Dutch, and the Israelis, and everybody else. <laughs> a bit of flag waving there from uh, from Peter. So um. I'm just going to put one question to each of our panelists in turn. Um, uh, so we asked through um, to our participants, and I apologise to those who weren't able to contribute to the Slido. It seems there were some issues with doing it that way. Um, I haven't yet found an, a seamless way of getting everyone to contribute views via this type of format. So apologies for that. But the question we put to our, um, our participants was, what would you like to see? Um, money going to um, if Welsh government were to invest in supporting horticulture. So I'll ask each of our panellists to say something on that in turn, but also combine it with the question of who is it? So we've got this kind of now this shared sense that we could be really ambitious um, and maybe even work towards this 75% um, target by 2035. So who needs to make it happen? So the, that's the two part question I'll put to you all that what do you want the money to go on and who needs to make it happen? Um, so I'm going to go to Sarah. Oh, Amber's ready to go. There you go. Well, I can get it over and done with, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I, I think the key, I think we've got everything in place apart from that capital investment piece. I think that um, giving, putting investment in right now would be is, is the key to moving things forward right now. So cap capital investment, and then that will free up some of the other money for um, people to pay people and that sort of thing so that's my one key thing and in terms of who I think we're I think all of us and maybe that's a cop-out but I think we all have a part to play um, and I think we've got everybody around the table now it feels like there's a really good um, uh, collaboration going on in Wales and I think um, yeah we just need to work on it um, we need there's more we need to do with the retail sector i would say and um that's part of our challenge in peas please um there's much more that can be done there um but yeah i think all the ducks are lined up we just need to keep keep working at it that's my thoughts thanks i was thinking about that uh, metaphor of the ducks being in a row earlier and wondering if we need a more vegetable based alternative that's slightly less 
hunting and violence related as well. So if anybody wants to come up with an alternative to getting your ducks in a row. Peas um, in a pod. Yeah. <laughs> Peas in a pod might be the one. <laughs> um, Peter or Sarah, who wants to go next, answering the question about where the money needs to go and who to lead? So Sarah, looks like you're up. Oh, thank you, Peter. Um, yeah, very much the same as, as Amber. Capital grants, 100% but a simple process of applying for that capital grant and um, not too technical the requirements for it. Um, and yeah, I would agree. I think we're all involved, but I've seen a tremendous amount of collaboration in the last two years. I think there's, there's great energy out there um, and we do all want the same thing. We're all traveling in the right direction. So yeah, it's, it's for all of us, as Peter said earlier, Great. And Peter, your thoughts on this question then? Uh, the first part is quite simple. I, I, I understand what everybody said about capital grants and everything else, but I would caution you to really be much more cautious, caution, cautious, um, and wait a little bit. I mean, to get everybody's views together, what is necessary, it's not always the most obvious uh, in terms of what can be done when, and there are priorities in the political world. So I would not go down rushing to figure out, you know, how much money and where it should be spent on yet. I would be really focused on getting a team of people together that can really take the issue forward and not too big a team either. I mean, if you've got 10 or 11 or 12 people, that's more than enough to get a really good thinking session that can do things going. And so I think that needs thinking about as a priority. And then all the other things will come from that sort of grouping, if it's successful. Great, thank you. Um, so I was just gonna, um, as by way of bringing things together, um, and it follows nicely on from that point from Peter, just um, give Amber and Sarah a chance to say about what, what they've got coming up and where they see the next steps um, that are already in in mind that will um hopefully help progress um this vision and activity that we're all so keen to see happening so amber do you want to just say a bit about what's happening from your side of things and where people might look out to get involved um yeah i wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the peas please veg advocate program so we're um at the moment running workshops um across um the uk and uh, Food Sense Wales is uh, running them in Wales um, to recruit people um, into um, the mission of getting um, the UK eating more veg. Um, so if you want to be a veg advocate, then please um, contact food uh, and you live in Wales, please contact uh, Food Sense Wales on that, because um, the more people we get involved in this um, program, you know, in this mission, the, the more likely it's going to happen. Um, I'm excited to be um, like going to be hopefully involved in the uh, um, stakeholder group for the vision for moving forward with the vision and I, Sarah I will pass over on to you I guess to explain a little bit more or do you want me to explain I'll pass over on to Sarah I think to explain that. yeah no no feel free to add in but yes our next plans will be to set up a um, horticulture stakeholder group um, and as we start to form that I mean what I hope is that that will be all of horticulture coming together and that the same issues are for many of our ornamental growers as our edible growers I take on board Peter's point that um, that doesn't need to be a huge group but obviously we need all those key players in there that we're we're, we're all working with anyway. Um, and aside to that, we will be having a plant health stakeholder group as well for Welsh Girl Plant Health. And we see those stakeholder groups very much as a um, feed, feed up from the growers themselves to Welsh Gov and feed or sideways and feed things from Welsh Gov out, out to growers, but also get those messages um, aligned and really have, um, have a good discussion in that group as to what um, 
what the next steps are. I think I take on board what Peter's saying. Capital grants could be a quick win now. And, and I'm watching out in case there's any spare money that could be directed in that way. Um, but it's important that those um, cauliflowers are lined up or whatever we decide to use for going forward. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think um, good to hear that um, people are keen to kind of um, discuss what we want to do together and kind of uh, collaborate on putting together a vision. And I think hopefully there'll be a lot of enthusiasm for getting involved in um, the group and discussions around that via Tavi Cymru. Um, I'm just going to take the chance to do my own plug, um, given that we have been talking about collaboration and making the most of all the good work that's going on in Wales. Um, with colleagues at uh, Sustainable Places, we're currently working to map all the initiatives that are going on around the country. Um, that will, and then the intention is to work out where there might be needs for greater coordination or gaps to fill. So there's a survey that you can fill in about your initiative, um, and that will develop this network map um, to show all the good things that are going on um, to do with food in Wales. So uh, hopefully we've addressed all the great questions that uh, people were contributing um, and had some great um, contributions from the panellists. So I'd like to thank them very much for their time and their uh, wisdom. I'd like to thank you all for listening and uh, to remind you that um, there's a session on the food revo revolution and how it might happen later on this afternoon, um, which sounds really great. And um, I will certainly be tuning in. So hope to see some of you there.